Good morning. I hope you have a marvelous day or afternoon or evening today. Today, we do reading slash pronunciation slash vocabulary learning in addition to listening, which is pretty much what you do right now. In our last episode of this podcast of training for pronunciation and vocabulary mastery, we have only discussed the word pine. And we said that the word has a wide gamut of meanings that are tailored to each specific context. And building on this kind of context, we cannot for sure specify that this word has this meaning. You can say it a dime a dozen in spoken English. When we say that this thing is a dime a dozen, actually it means that it's so common. Let me explain. Because part of our learning is to learn. And one way we do that is by looking at the word or the expression and how it is used, how it functions, how it performs in daily use. or among people, and how their usage manifests the meaning of this expression. So a dime a dozen is actually a very common expression in English, and it means that this thing is so common. Everyone is using it or has it. And let's think of it that way, by dividing the expression into two parts. A dime is the smallest unit of currency in the United States or in the English system. A dozen is pretty much 12 items. So if we say that the dozen is only for one dime, now you get the point. So I can buy, for example, 12 eggs, which are a dozen for one dime, and that manifests the fact that this item is very common. It's very common in this society, in this language. Now, this expression has become a piece of cake for you, and now you can use it to say Anything that is dirt cheap. That is dirt cheap. And dirt is the soil of earth. So when, when we say this is a dirt cheap, we pretty much mean that's, that this thing is very affordable. But we don't say it's cheap for things that are not supposed to be cheap. Because we have cheap talk. We have cheap people, we have cheap items, we have cheap cars. The word cheap is not equivalent to the word affordable. And it's a bit offensive to use the word cheap for things that you want to buy from people. Um, it's, it's something that you, you should bear in mind. It's kind of like um, you ask about something or you ask for something and you discover that this thing is manufactured from plastic that is recycled in China, for example. That's cheap plastic. That's not affordable. When we say the word affordable, we mean that we can pay it from our own pocket money without breaking our bank. Without breaking our bank. To break someone's bank it means to cost them an arm and a leg, to cost them so much money. So that's a penny for your thoughts. That's a penny for your thoughts. We say that's a penny for your thoughts. That's extra information that I'm just throwing on the table for you to use. A penny for your thoughts. 
So that's actually a penny for your thoughts. If you share with me something useful, I would say a penny for your thoughts. I can give people a penny for my thoughts. So this is exactly what I mean. Now, you need to process this. And for you to process it, you have to have all, you have to give me all ears to listen carefully to what I am saying here, because it's very important. Now, last time we had a discussion and in the discussion for 27 minutes, we talked about the word fine and we tried to discuss the meaning of this word, how it manifests in usage. And um, we tried to be on the same boat in this regard. Um, I tried to put, point out that this word has so many meanings, depending on uh, the kind of uh, context that we have. So if we look here, so if we look here, she did not care or she didn't care. She had 38 pennies. Now that's a penny for your thoughts. That's a penny for your thoughts. You need to be all ears to listen carefully to what I am saying here because it's very important. She didn't care or she did not care. The truncation here of did not and didn't is for sake of brevity or shortness or being short or being brief or being to the point. So when we say she didn't care, she had 38 pennies. If you're a good trader, all you need is somewhere to start. All you need, all you need is somewhere to start. If you are a good trader, all you need is somewhere to start. Let's start again from the get go. She didn't care. Some people say she did not care. Some people say she didn't care. Some people say she did not care. And everyone has his own way and approach of saying this beautiful expression. She didn't care. She had 38 pennies. She had 38 pennies. And when we talk, um, when we talk about the tenses and aspects, which is something grammatical, I don't want to, you know, bring it to the, to the table of discussion here. Despite the fact that you have to bite the bullet and learn the basic tenses. You only need three or four tenses and aspects to master English speaking. You do not need to be very professional in all the aspects and tenses of English. So break a leg and start learning these expressions. Try to start to learn first the past simple present, simple, and the future, and how they form the majority of the English sentence structures. You need to burn the midnight oil to get to a point where you satisfactorily achieve threshold of learning of the tenses. Because if, if you do not speak with sound English, to the ears and assessment of native speakers, you have some weaknesses here and there. We're not shooting for being perfect speakers of English. We try as much as possible, be professional English speakers. So you need to bite the bullet, 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 to bite the bullet and learn the basic structures and sentences of English. Sometimes I say we have to bite the bullet. And the story behind this goes back to the Civil War, where people had to remove part of their bodies because of injury. So they had to bite something 
between their teeth. So when they scream, when people are just amputating, the legs are hands, I'm sorry for this gory kind of imagery that I'm bringing to your imagination right now. But this is, I guess, but this is, I guess, on top of my mind, uh, the meaning of this, to bite the bullet. Anyways, so when we speak English, some people think, hmm, he has made a mistake here. You're not a judge of this person, first of all. You're just a learner. We are all learners. We make mistakes, and these are not mistakes. These are signs of development. So I am not caught red-handed in a crime. I am not caught red-handed in a crime when I make this grammatical mistake or that a grammatical mistake. I mean, I mean, how dare you? You come to a learner in his first stage of learning of English and say, mm, don't say, don't say it this way, say it that way. Don't say it this way, say it that way. I mean, how dare you? You come to a learner in his first early stages of learning of English and say this and don't say that. This is wrong and this is right. This is English. As, as, as long as he is conveying and getting the point across to the, to the speaker, to the listener, he's, he's okay. I mean, he's just getting his point across. He's trying to make the basic, decent English sentence. So give him some, you know, cut him some slack. Cut him some slack. Give him a chance. Give him a chance to grow because growth takes time. Don't cry over spilled milk. Just because he is making this mistake again and again doesn't mean he's a bad speaker. He's just trying to learn. Probably he's going to be cognizant of this mistake in the coming times where he says it again. So give him a chance. Cut him some slack, as we say in English, which means give him a chance to, uh, to say this word or that word, even mistakenly, that doesn't mean he's just making, you know, uh, a sin. Because, sadly speaking, in Middle East, we equate grammatical mistakes to religious sins. I mean, how could that be possible? That when we say he made a mistake, which means, عمل شيء خطأ. This is religiously speaking, in, in, in the religiosity of Middle East, this is a sin. If you make a mistake, I mean, you should seek purgation to some extent by some people. But the idea is that the, the religiosity of Middle East imposes certain kind of norms and conditions regarding the way people talk. But since we are learners of English, we need to break that rule. We have to agree, you know, grammatical mistakes are signs of development. So. I need to cut to the chase here. I mean, I need to be brief and to the point. I need to cut to the chase. And by cutting to the chase, I just point out where I'm reading right now. So fine, she didn't care. She had 38 pennies. We agree that had is the past main verb. It's not the uh, singular, it's, it's not the auxiliary verb. So when we say she had 30 eight pennies, we talk about an event in the past. We are not seeking for the main verb. We're just practicing, practicing the way we say she has 38 pennies in the past, but we are saying it, you know, we're saying it based on the past dimension here. However, some people are not tolerant with the fact that people can make mistakes and are making mistakes in, 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 in the learning process of English. And I tell, I tell them, this is my word for you. Don't judge a book by its cover because 
you know, once you see the trajectory of how they are evolving and how in- their English is getting better, this is going to be so much different in the next phase of their learning trajectory. You know, you might see people on very advanced level. And since you are stagnant in your position, uh, statically speaking, you're not moving. You're not progressing, you're not reading, you're not listening, and you keep judging people, that's something wrong. You have to embrace the fact that everyone makes mistakes. Uh, and I'm, I'm derailing from my speech here that I have prepared, which is analyzing this kind of uh, podcast. But as I said again, the, the idea of this podcast is, is not just to read, but to throw on the table expressions, common common sayings or what do we call that idioms idioms saying common saying that we do have in 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 our society and we 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 use them we say them frequently but we don't realize like for example this morning in um in the iraqi context when we say um you know you you need to hit the brakes we we mean you have to stop suddenly but in Arabic, in, in the Iraqi version of Arabic dialect, we say nilzam, which means to hold, ilzam break, hold the brakes, as if you are holding. So this kind of metaphorical imagery that we do have here transferred into a dramatic expression uh, over two different dimensions, two different cultures, from L1 to L2, language one to language two. You see, there is variety of expressions, variety of implications, different set of imageries based on the kind of context that we are using it. That's not something bad, by the way. In English, we say every cloud has a silver lining. Every cloud has a silver lining means that just just because it looks difficult, just because there's so dissimilarity between Arabic and English doesn't mean that these two languages uh, should be the same. Not only do, do you see things differently in both languages, but you see different imageries, different set of norms and idioms, different kind of expressions based on culture. Like when we talk about English, we talk about the culture of horses, the culture of pigs, the culture of animals, the culture of, you know, traditional life. When we talk about Arabic, we talk about desert, we talk about farmers, we talk about people who live in the city versus people who live in towns and villages and the suburbs. Every set of geographical differences that you see here implies different cultural norms and different cultural traditions, which projects on the use of language. A language is just a mirror of society. It's it's a social organism. Um, and because it's a social organism, it's not static. It flows like a river. You may be see, seeing the surface of the river, but you're not seeing deep inside, down deep in this river. There are things that we don't see in language because they are kind of like statistically, because they are not kind of like statistically not common in spoken English. So look here. Look at this texture, the fabrics of this language, and how it is colorful with different tenses, different uh, kind of uh, expressions and idioms. You you cannot say language is like whatever is available in dictionary. No, this is not the real language. If you if you if you take language out of society. Um, you, it's like a fish out of water. Language lives in society. It feeds on society. Without society, without people, there is no language. It is said that there is um, a kind of language that is so rare that only two people um, speak it. So when their researchers wanted to document this kind of language, they couldn't come in good terms with those, those two people because they were just in disagreement with each other. So it's, it's very funny 
then uh, sometimes, sometimes, I'm saying, you, you need to look at the language as part of society. If, if you want to learn English, look at the museums, the theaters, the plays uh, that are played, uh, how people live in and work in society, how they uh, go about cooking. These are things will bring you closer to the, the, the microcosm of, uh, um, of language, the microcosmic level of this ecology of uh, the forest of language. It's, it's so rich with variety of expressions and things that sometimes you think, hmm, this is the, just the first time that I hear this. Where is that coming from? Uh, and, and you may be wondering that, but to give you a taste of your own medicine, learners of English struggle with Arabic as much as you struggle, or probably the double amount of struggle that you struggle with learning English, because English is not at the, uh, at the syntactic level of complexity of Arabic. Arabic is so dense, historical, historically speaking, denser than um, as a Semitic language than, than the Indo-European languages in general or the Germanic languages uh, or the, uh, the languages that are derived from Latin and Greek. I mean, except for uh, French, for example, because it's, it, it's dense as well. Um, anyways, so to be on the same page for, for our podcast tonight, I keep presenting the same page to you here, but the idea is not about the pages. It's, it's about the chat that we develop with each other. The, this kind of chat um, is, is very important. It's very quintessential to your learning trajectory of English. If you keep listening to me, if you, if you, if you write down the list of uh, words that I'm saying here, intentionally, actually, I'm throwing on the table many words, many expressions that you may hear them once in a blue moon. However, just because you do not recognize that kind of expression doesn't mean that that kind of expression is not common in English. It's just that you haven't heard it because you haven't listened enough. You, you, you don't say it because you haven't spoken enough. So keep your chin up. Start practicing. Document your work. Record yourself using a camera or um, a selfie. And post it on YouTube on a private link. And watch yourself talking. Let's cut to the chase. You cannot... Learn to speak English by just taking English classes at universities. You will not speak English by just taking few lectures in a private institute. You will never learn English from completing your master or PhD in English. These are probably pathways to redirect your future plans of work and profession but they are not 100% contributing to you becoming a good speaker. To be a good speaker, you have to practice speaking about very difficult topics, but you have to scale that up, raise the bar of challenge, get to a point where you feel challenged to speak about this topic, practice speaking about it multiple times, and the multiplicity of times that you keep practicing, you will notice that you are making a progress, you're improving, you're getting better every time you talk about the topic again. And, and let me tell you something, you're not missing the boat if you are older, if you're older than 30 years, you're not missing the boat of mastering English. You can be over the moon once you achieve the threshold of proficiency at the advanced level, for example, and you see yourself practicing speaking, talking with everyone flexibly about things, being fluent. By the way, being fluent doesn't mean being accurate, but the idea is that naturally, organically expressing your thoughts in a way that is satisfactory to the context of uh, discourse that you're, that you're doing between you. 
and, and, and the context of discourse that is occurring. And when we talk, when we present this kind of topic, you need to read between the lines. Interesting. Um, I'm saying you need to read between the lines. It means you have to deduct, you have to conclude, you have to criti critically analyze what I'm saying. Um, if you're investing this amount of money, you have to put your money where your mouth is. Um, so wh when we talk about investing money in this course, because we are to the end of the summer season right now, uh, I'm not sure, depending on the country where you are from, but you have to put your money where your mouth is. This is a very common expression, but I'm associating this kind of expression with the fact that sometimes invest money in occasions and places where they give you the chance to speak so much with so much criticism and feedback. Positive one, not particularly negative, but the idea is embrace the fact that sometimes criticism takes you to the next level of proficiency in English. It takes you to a very satisfactory level. Embrace that. Going back to the reading, because we need to finish this. So fine, she didn't care. She had the 38 pennies. And if you are a good trader, all you need is somewhere to start. And the good trader is a person who works in the, in the field of commerce, in the field of trading things, selling and buying things. So to this point, we have achieved a certain amount of, you know, listening. So far, we have covered part of the story. This is not the end of the story, to be honest. And if you keep going back to the first, the, the, the beginnings of this podcast, you see that the, the story is divided into small chunks because, because you know, divide and conquer. I, I want you to just not enjoy reading short snippets of the story, but to, to look and read between the lines. I'm presenting to you with more than, in this podcast, more than probably 30 expressions, common idioms in English, by only reading three lines. Come on. What are you doing here? You have to write them down. You have to record yourself talking and using them and invest in this podcast in a way that you see conducive to your learning progress to the trajectory of your progress of learning. You know, at some point, you need to stop worrying and start living the real English by speaking it, by challenging yourself. That is the real important thing, you know. And in order to do so, start investing some time to practice English speaking. Have a wonderful day or evening.